Virginia Beach. Stephanie Potter, Department of Aging and Rehabilitative Services. I think she's outside too. And Shanita Bigthia, Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. She's, she's saying hello. Our first program is a general overview of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 2001 and the amendments of 2010. Our presenter, Ms. Emily Fisher, represents the Independent Center of Southampton Roads. The, the Independent Center is a nonprofit organization serving Southampton Roads for more than 30 years. It is the largest and oldest of all the, the 15 centers of independent living in the state of Virginia. The center provides four course services to the public. Peer mentoring, independent living skills training, inf information and referral, and its main focus, disability advocacy. Emily Fisher is the advocate coordinator at the Independent Center. She works in advanced policy and practice for people with disabilities to ensure their rights in our community. Her job includes consultations with local and federal governments on accessibility and bar barrier removal and offers technical assistance to help employers, other covered entities, and persons with disabilities learn about their obligations and rights under the provisions of the Americans with Disabilities Act. She's currently, suddenly, she currently sits on several transportation committees throughout Hampton Roads, is the co-chair of the Hampton Roads Consortium for Children and Youth with Special Needs. Be before beginning work at the Independence Center in 2010, she worked for the City of Virginia Beach in the Therapeutic Recreation Department for nine years. She earned a Bachelor's of Science in Psychology from Virginia Commonwealth of Univers University and is currently pursuing her Master's <coughs> in Public Health at Eastern Virginia Medical School. Ms. Fisher will answer your, your questions at the end of her presentation. Thank you.
regards to pools, um, a lot of hotels um, were not pleased with this, and so DOJ actually ended up extending um, the deadline by, I think it was 10 months, um, to allow them more time to do research on lists and that type of thing. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other critical changes um, today. So who is considered disabled under the ADA? Um, a person is considered disabled if they meet one of the following criteria. Um, someone with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, do you guys, anybody think of uh, major life activities? Walking, good one. Anyone, go ahead. Oh, do I need to use the mic? Sorry, thought it was gonna be loud enough. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so walking is one, breathing, um, you name it. I mean, you guys probably know what they are. Um, someone with a record or a history of a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits um, one or more major life activities. So if you um, had, um, I'm trying to think of something, maybe MS or a hearing impairment or something like that that could be remedied sometimes or, or not, that type of thing. Um, and then someone who is regarded as having such an impairment. So someone, if you think someone has a disability and you are treating them like that, then they would be covered under the ADA. Um, this is a list of major life activities. Um, caring for oneself, uh, seeing, breathing, reproduction, um, sleeping, standing, reading. Um, you guys can read that. Um, the Amendments Act added bodily functions to the major um, life activities list um, and, and some other um, genetic, biological things, um, normal cell growth, uh, digestive bowel and bladder systems, neurological systems, immune systems. Um, so there's quite a few things that you wouldn't necessarily think that would be covered under the ADA, but are now. Um, a record or history of substantial limitation. Um, so someone who's a cancer survivor, um, someone with a brain injury, <coughs> excuse me, um, a person with a history of drug or alcohol addiction. Um, and this is kind of a fuzzy area. Um, I think you have to go to rehab to be considered someone with a disability in this category. Um, so if you haven't gone to rehab, then I am pretty sure that you're not necessarily covered. Um, Someone as regarded as having a, pers or a disability. So someone with a visible birthmark, <coughs> someone rumored to have a disability, someone with an impairment that doesn't limit them substantially, but others regard them as limited. So the ADA is organized into five titles. Title one is employment, two is state and local government, three is public accommodations or private businesses, um, four is telecommunications, and five is miscellaneous. Title I, Employment. So one of the big things um, that employment is associated with is job accommodations. And a lot of employers are hesitant to hire people with disabilities because they think that job accommodations are going to cost an arm and a leg. Um, as you look at this slide, you can see that I think it's close to 70% of the accommodations cost less than $500. That's not a lot for a business if you really think about it. Um, and 1% costs more than 5,000. So um, job, ac job accommodations are a really big thing that you need um, to be looking into if you're hiring people with a disability. Um, fact, the ADA provides equal access to the employment process but does not require employers to proactively hire persons with disabilities. Um, who is covered under the ADA employment requirements? So employees, a qualified individual who has, has a record of, or is regarded as having a physical or mental impairment 
a bodily function that substantially limits a major life activity. Any questions? No? Okay. Um, who is covered under Title I? So employers, so private employers with more than 15 employees um, and state and local government employers of any size. Uh, the 15 employees is important <coughs> to remember. Um, if they don't have 15 employees, then they're not, they don't fall under the ADA. Um, U.S. government and executive and judicial branch, they're covered under Section 504 of the Rehab Act, which is actually um, the law that the ADA was modeled after. Um, 504 deals with federal government and ADA deals with basically everything else. Um, Indian tribes are not covered and bona fide private membership clubs are not covered either. Uh, Elements addressed by the ADA. So the ADA covers all elements of employment, including applications, interviewing, screening, and hiring um, on the job once hired and benefits and privileges of the employee. Um, so the ADA is involved in all those different aspects. Um, two important terms to know for the employment section are essential functions and reasonable accommodation. Um, does anybody know what the essential functions definition is? No? Okay. Um, they're tasks for which the position exists. Without these duties, the job would not exist or it would be fundamentally different. Reasonable accommodations are defined as any modification or adjustment to a job, an employment practice, or the work environment that makes it possible for an individual with a disability to enjoy an equal employment opportunity. Um, I was at a conference a couple months ago and they um, brought up a good example of um, essential functions and reasonable accommodation. There's a gentleman who um, was in his sister's wedding and the night before the wedding they were all hanging out and he dove into a lake that he couldn't see the bottom of and became a quadriplegic. He was a construction manager. His company had put 10 years of um, work into him, educating him on certain things. He was one of their best employers, employees. So what they decided was they were going to figure out how to accommodate him any way they could to keep him as an employee of their company. So he maintained a, a, the position of a site um, overseer in this construction company. And it was a, a big construction company, like commercial businesses. It was not residential. Um, and the main accommodation that they utilized was they, uh, how many of you guys have heard of FaceTime? FaceTime, Skype, that type of thing? They would have a worker at the site with an iPad and he would be in the office or at home with that same technology and when there was an issue, the worker with the iPad would turn it on call him, and then show him the issue that was going on, and he was able to address it from being at home or in the office. That's a pretty awesome, you know, accommodation if you think, I mean, it's simple, too. iPads, what, $500? It's not that much. So a quadriplegic was able to maintain a construction site supervisor position. Um, reasonable accommodations, they could include, um, Altering when or how the essential function is performed. So like I just told you in the example, um, he was still able to perform the essential functions of the construction management position. He just wasn't on site doing it. Um, changing the schedule of work. So if someone um, maybe has fibromyalgia and they have difficulty getting up in the morning, maybe instead of working a 9 to 5, they can work 10 to 6, uh, that type of thing. Um, providing interpreters or readers, uh, modifying exams, training materials, and, or policies. Um, I actually had this come up um, a couple of weeks ago as well. Someone was trying out to be a merchant marine, um, and he had ADD, and he needed someone to read the test to him rather than to him just sit down with the test all in front of him. It was too much information. Um, so he was looking for that accommodation. 
Um, and obtaining or modifying equipment like a TTY or a lighted alarms. Do you guys know what a TTY is? Yeah, okay. Reasonable accommodations. Employers are required to provide reasonable accommodations unless to do so would cause an undue burden. Employers can choose the cheaper or easier accommodation if several accommodations will work. So undue burden um, is kind of a touchy subject um, and it's based on um, an individual basis. So it's not collective. You can't say, well, this is considered across the board an undue burden. Um, it's what the business would um, have to go through, pay to provide that reasonable accommodation. And if several different accommodations will work for the individual, then the employer is allowed to choose the cheaper one. So if, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. I guess you could use cart or interpreter. That's not the best. Um, Depending on the services, some can be cheaper than others, so the employer could choose one over the other. I'm not saying that would necessarily work all the time, but um, it's an example. Applications and interviewing. So no questions regarding disability should be listed on the application. This includes questions on history of workers' compensation claims, previous work injuries, and medical history. Um, Job seekers are responsible for requesting needed accommodations for the interview. Um, if you're a person with a disability, it's your responsibility to tell the um, business the accommodations that you need. The business should not assume that you need an accommodation. They're taught not to assume anything, um, except maybe competence. Um, employers um, should pay for the accommodations needed. Um, interviewing. So these are the things that an employer can ask. Um, if the applicant can perform the job functions with or without reasonable accommodation. So if someone has a visual impairment and um, you know they're coming in, the employer could say, would you need an accommodation or would you not need an accommodation to perform these job functions? Um, if the applicant can perform all the job functions, not just the essential functions. So going through the list and saying, you know, are you able to perform all these functions? Um, and if the applicant can meet the attendance requirements of the job. Interviewing, questions that you should not include. Um, if the applicant will need medical leave, questions about the applicant's illness or disability related to ability to meet attendance requirement. Nature or severity of the disability, condition causing the disability, prognosis, and treatment. Basically, it's none of your business. Um, pre employment screening and testing. Um, it must be related and consistent with business needs. Um, so, if a health screening is done for all employees after they've been offered the job, then you're allowed to do that for a person with a disability. However, you can't require that person to get a health screening before you offer them the job. Um, and it must be given with reasonable accommodation unless the specific skill requiring accommodations is being tested. Medical examinations. Um, so post-job offer, I, I talked about this. Um, disclosure, reasonable documentation. Documentation from an appropriate professional concerning the individual's disability and functional limitation. Um, and to verify the existence of a disability and the need for an accommodation. So that's something that you can't ask for as an employer. Um, the EEOC um, takes complaints in regards to employment and you would be surprised how many employers um, discriminate against workers with disabilities. That's probably one of the um, biggest INR calls I do is, you know, I listen to them and they tell me what their issue is and I say, well, you need to call the EEOC. Um, and basically what happens with the EEOC is you tell them what has occurred and you have to do it within 180 days of the occurrence or else it's not valid to them type thing. Um, and then they'll review it on their own terms and then they will give you a right to sue letter. Um, you can't do anything until you get the right to sue letter. 
And if you get the right to sue letter, then you can proceed for it. If you don't, then there's not really a lot that can go on. Title II, state and local government. <clears throat> So there's four broad areas of requirements, general non-discrimination, program accessibility, equally effective communication, and employment. General requirements. So state and local government must provide full program access to people with disabilities. One of each type of program must be accessible, but not at every location. So a lot of government locations, um, especially if they're older cities, have older buildings that are historic. Um, if they have programs that are offered in that building and someone and it's not accessible, they can move that program to a different building that is accessible. Um, they don't necessarily have to make that building accessible. Um, agencies that receive government contracts must comply as well. Government programs and services covered by the ADA. So courthouses, libraries, recreation centers, senior adult community centers, social services, mental health, schools, polling places, and information. Um, the polling places is an interesting um, area because they're often done in churches as well. So making sure that a church is accessible um, is, is kind of an awkward situation because churches aren't covered by the ADA, but if they're being used for polling purposes, then it kind of gets a little sticky. Um, are these places accessible? The parking, entrance, primary service area, restrooms, and meeting rooms. Um, when a building or a, an entity is doing um, renovations or fixing things or making things accessible, what's the point if the inside building is accessible but there's no accessible parking or entrance? Fantastic, the inside of your building is accessible, but you have stairs going up there. How the heck am I going to get up there if I use a wheelchair? So that's why it goes parking entrance, that type of thing. Um, program access. So there's methods of achieving program access, um, and they include redesign of equipment, reassignment to accessible buildings, home visits, delivery of services at alternative accessible sites, alteration of existing facilities, and providing auxiliary aids like interpreters, cart services, assistive listening devices, et cetera. Um, the important thing to remember about providing auxiliary aids is that you often need to request these accommodations with some time in advance. So if you're going to um, a city council meeting and you are deaf and you need an interpreter, you better <coughs> call you know, a good amount of time in advance. Um, as soon as you make the decision to attend, you should really call and request those services. Um, so that gives them ample time to find a interpreter for you. Um, what the law says is that the entity must make a good faith effort. Um, that's as far as it's defined, um, unfortunately. So making a good faith effort to provide cart services or interpreters, that type of thing. Program access. So local government cannot require participation in special or separate programs. Um, Shirley mentioned that I worked for therapeutic recreation. Just because the city of Virginia Beach has a therapeutic recreation department doesn't mean that every citizen with a physical or mental impairment is required to attend recreational activities through the therapeutic recreation department. They can certainly go into another one and there's a whole process into all that. But that type of thing. Um, it can't require a person to accept an accommodation, and um, they use eligibility requirements for programs that screen out people with disabilities. So um, you wouldn't want to put, um, unless it's an essential function of the program, you wouldn't want to put has to be able to read at a second grade level or something like that. If it's for a swimming class, that doesn't make any sense. Um, Program access through policy modifications. So programs must make reasonable modifications of policies, practices, and procedures to avoid discrimination unless the modification would fundamentally alter the activities and services. Can anybody think of an example of this? No? I don't remember if I have one. No, I don't. Um, 
One that's given a little bit later in the presentation, but I'll go ahead and tell you guys now, is if a planetarium, um, so someone with a visual impairment who needs lots of light can't go to a planetarium and say, hey, I need you to turn on the light so I can see. That totally defeats the purpose of going to a planetarium. That type of thing. Um, auxiliary aids and effective communication. People with disabilities that affect communication are entitled to auxiliary aids and services unless the result is a fundamental alteration, undue burden, or undue hardship. Undue hardship, you'll see undue burden, undue hardship. ADA uses it interchangeably. I think undue burden is in Title I, and I think undue hardship is in Title II. It basically means the same thing. Um, auxiliary aids and services. Staff working at state and local government service offices must be trained to receive and return relay calls and utilize TTYs if available. How many of you guys have ever gotten a relay call? Okay. It's a little awkward. Um, I'll be the first one to say it because you're talking, um, you're, you're supposed to talk directly to the person that's two people away from you, if that kind of makes sense. So, you you know, a lot of times it'll be like, this is Swanson Relay number, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, you have a call from so-and-so, that type of thing. And so there's a, lots of awkward pauses because you're waiting for them to sign to the individual. Um, the best etiquette is really to say, hi, Mrs. Johnson, how are you today? Long pause. I'm doing well, how are you? So. Um, it does get a bit confusing because you have that third person there, but that's the best practice is to pretend like that third person isn't there and um, just be patient and wait for the conversation to continue. Um, 911 services must be direct um, call for people using TTYs and cannot require users to call 711 and relay access first. Um, this is important, why? Okay, just want to make sure. Um, structural access, so new construction. Any facility that was built after 1992 must be designed so that it is readily accessible and usable by people with disabilities. Altered facilities, when alterations change usability of facilities, um, the altered portion must be readily accessible and usable by people with disabilities. Does everybody understand this? Yeah, okay. State and local government requirements. So action steps. So they are to designate a responsible employee, um, provide notice of ADA requirements, establish a grievance procedure, conduct a self-evaluation, and develop a transition plan um, if the locality employees, employs more than 50 people um, and then structural barriers exist. So each um, city is required to have an ADA coordinator um, and the city or county um, needs to have an action plan. So transition plans is a lot of times what they'll be called. Um, and basically what this is, is it's um, the city's uh, plan to transition um, unaccessible facilities to accessible facilities and how they're gonna do it and when they're gonna do it, that type of thing. Title II enforcement. <clears throat> um, you're gonna file a complaint with the Department of Justice. Um, during the government shutdown, the Department of Justice was shut down. <laughs> Um, and, you know, so you would get the, I got this email, I subscribed to their email list saying that a bunch of their attorneys are out and won't be back until it ends. So, unfortunately, that stuff does happen. Um, private lawsuits and then alternative dispute resolution including mediation. Um, these do happen. Um, a lot of times you'll hear about more mediation. Well, you won't hear about the lawsuits because they'll try and settle it during mediation and keep it quiet and figure out the process that way, um, which obviously you would think would be better than a lawsuit, but sometimes it's not. Um, title three is public accommodations. Do you guys want to take a break? Yes, no. No, okay. 
All right. So businesses are considered public accommodations. Um, restaurants, clothes stores, malls, movie theaters, grocery stores, um, skating rinks, hotels and motels, camping grounds, convenience stores, car dealerships. Basically, if it's not state and local government or federal government, it's private business or public accommodation, private business. Places that aren't public accommodations, private clubs, churches, private housing, state and local government offices and services. So very few things are listed under things that aren't public accommodations. Um, public accommodations cannot exclude people with disabilities based solely on their disability. Um, they cannot discriminate through contract. They cannot screen out people with disabilities with eligibility criteria, and they cannot require people with disabilities to participate in segregated programs, use separate areas, or accept accommodations they do not want. So it's similar to Title II. Um, public accommodations don't have to offer special products for people with disabilities. Um, bookstores don't have to offer books on tape for people who are blind, plain and simple. Restaurants don't have to have special menus for people who are allergic to wheat products, etc. They don't have to have the special menus, however, gluten allergies have become um, increasingly frequent throughout the United States and so you will often see gluten-free menu um, much as you see low calorie. I mean, I don't remember the last restaurant I went to that didn't have a gluten-free menu, so. It's a good thing to have, just like having a menu um, in Braille can be a good thing to have. Um, it's not required, but it's a nice accommodation to have. Um, if there's a restaurant that has an individual with a visual disability, another thing they can do is um, have servers be prepared to read the menu items to people with visual disabilities, that type of thing. Accessibility and barrier removal. Um, access means being able to enjoy the goods and services of businesses. Um, barriers can be created by policies, architectural features, and communication methods. Barrier removal um, can create access. A lot of times the barrier is something really easy to fix, plain and simple. Policy barriers. Um, so the requirements to have a driver's license to get a membership card. Not everybody with a disability can drive, but they certainly could access some other services at a YMCA or a rec center. Um, so having, and I'm not saying the YMCA has a requirement for a driver's license, I don't know what their requirement is, but I'm just saying that wouldn't necessarily be the greatest requirement. They could ask for an identification card or some form of government ID, that type of thing. Um, special seating times for people with disabilities, um, requiring that people with mobility aids have a companion with them, um, and requiring people with disabilities to utilize separate programs. Um, <coughs> policy barriers, reasonable changes that must be made to policies to allow access. So some examples are allowing customers to use um, a state issue ID um, instead of a driver's license, I mentioned that. Um, allowing more than one adult in a dressing room um, if a companion or assistant is necessary to assist that individual. Uh, changing a reservation system that cannot reserve a specific room so that accessible rooms are reserved for people with disabilities. Um, this was kind of a big thing with um, Expedia, cheap tickets, um, those types of websites, the third party websites for people booking um, hotel rooms because there was no way for hotels to tell if the person really needed the accessible room, that type of thing, and they were worried about it, but it's still required, so. Um, and then allowing service animals despite no pets allowed policies. Um, I laugh because this tends to be a controversial subject for people. Um, a, a huge thing is that restaurants are afraid to allow dogs into their facilities because they say health codes will ADA trumps health codes, that's important to remember. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the definition of a service animal um, in a little bit, because that has changed too. Oh, 
here we go. Okay, so service animals. So before the 2010 regulations, pretty much any animal was considered a service animal. I could have an iguana, I could have a cat, I could have a snake, I could have a bird, I could have a monkey, you name it. I could have it and say, this is my service animal. Well, and it happened, it happened. Um, I'm sure you guys heard about the IHOP in Chesapeake, and this is actually a couple months ago. Um, two individuals came in and said that they had, mon they had monkeys with them and said that they were their service animals and the manager of the Chesapeake IHOP said, you know, okay, I can't really do anything about it, it's a service animal, and let the monkeys eat at the IHOP with the owners. Obviously, that's not a service animal and that's not acceptable. Um, <laughs> So maybe IHOP needs some ADA training, I don't know. Um, the new definition of service animal is dogs only. Um, there are some exceptions for miniature horses. Um, I've, I've never seen a miniature horse used as a service animal in person. I've seen it in pictures though. Um, and it, from what I can tell, it, you know, it's legit. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, I did get a question earlier this year and I thought it was very interesting and I actually had to contact DOJ because I didn't know the answer to it. Um, and I went around my office because I was like, what do you guys think about this? Um, the question was, would a wolf-dog hybrid be covered under um, the service animal policy under the ADA? And DOJ said no. Um, and this was big because science has gone back and forth on whether or not wolves and dogs are the same thing, you know, scientifically when you start doing the naming type things. And so there's this big hullabaloo trying to figure out the answer. And um, DOJ has said, no, wolf dog hybrids are not covered under the ADA. So if you ever see someone saying they have a wolf dog hybrid as the ADA service animal, it's not true. Or it's not under the ADA. Um, <clears throat> um, the other thing that the definition, the definition changed as to what the animal has to do. So a lot of times people were saying that, oh, this is my dog and I need it for comfort. That doesn't fly with the ADA. Um, in fair housing, it works. You can have an emotional support animal. ADA does not cover emotional support animals. The animal must perform a task. So some people say, well, what tasks? You know, how do you define a task, that type of thing. Um, the way that I think about it is, if I have an anxiety attack when I go into large populations of people, and the dog is trained to sense that anxiety in myself and then comes over and licks my hand to calm me down, that's a task. A lot of times they'll be opening doors for people who have mobility impairments. Some dogs can um, detect um, changes in blood sugar or seizures, um, that type of thing. <clears throat> so you may see somebody that doesn't have a physical impairment and say, why the heck do they have a dog? Makes no sense, but you never know. Um, <coughs> policy barriers. Policies that maintain um, the basic and fundamental nature of a business do not have to be altered. So I talked about the planetarium. Um, roller coasters, they don't have to go slow so someone with a heart condition can ride it. Obviously, that wouldn't be a very fun roller coaster. Wouldn't get the same effect um, as you would if it were normally operating. Um, businesses also don't have to provide personal assistance services for individuals. Um, so if someone with a disability who needs help eating goes into a restaurant, a waiter is not required to sit there and help um, feed them. Uh, personal mobility devices for an individual. So um, this says like a wheelchair at a mall a lot, a lot of times, excuse me. <clears throat> um, malls do have wheelchairs and a lot of places have wheelchairs if you ask for them. Um, but it's not required. Automatic doors are not required. A lot of people seem to think that it should be a requirement, but it's not. Um, and supervision for a service animal. So another thing with the service animal is that they're supposed to be under control at all times um, and by the owner. And so the owner can't just say, hey, can you watch my service animal to whoever is there. 
Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention about service animals is there's a lot of um, speculation on what um, certifications a service animal has to have. There's no certification that's required under federal law. Um, you'll see a lot of websites that say, here's a hundred or pay $130 and here's a little sheet of paper that says you have a service animal. It's BS. Um, you know, the person can certainly pay for one of those, but it doesn't guarantee anything. Um, there are, yes, go ahead. Oh, are there certain breeds of dogs that, okay. Nope, and other than the wolf dog hybrid, there's no such thing as a breed restriction either. So someone can have a Chihuahua or a Great Dane, it doesn't matter. Um, the other identification piece is um, state laws will require um, certain identifying measures um, such as leashes or collars. You'll often see the blaze orange or the vest and all that kind of stuff. ADA does not require any of that. And federal law trumps state law. So um, while the person who lives in that state may follow those regulations, if they go to another state and the regulations are different, they're not going to get in trouble. The ADA is still covering them as this. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Um, businesses cannot charge for accessibility features. Um, so hotels can't charge for accessible rooms. Um, I just uh, was over at a hotel a week or two ago and I was looking at their rooms and the accessibility features and there's you know, that's the other thing you have to remember is a lot of times places will claim to have accessible rooms and they're not accessible. Um, so that's important to remember too when you're going and looking at accessible features. Um, businesses can require refundable deposits for auxiliary aids um, and they can charge if the service animal does damage to the room, um, just like they would with any other dog that does damage to a room. The hotel can certainly charge for the damage if the service animal does damage. Uh, architectural barriers. Um, they're physical features of a building that limit accessibility. Um, we talked about stairs. Um, that's a big one that we see. Um, <clears throat> A few other things are narrow doors. You'll find those in a lot of older buildings. Um, I had someone come to me and say, well, the, uh, I think last week, the door was 24 inches wide. And, I'm sit and they're saying they, their participant uses a manual wheelchair. And I'm like, well, good luck getting in there, because that's not going to happen. Um, 32 inches wide is the door width, just in case you were wondering. Um, High counters, thick carpeting, low lighting, high and low tables, low hanging items. Why would low hanging items be an issue? Someone else. Thank you, good job. Um, so someone who is blind or has a visual impairment, a lot of times they use a cane that helps them detect um, things on the floor. Well, if you have a ceiling or so, some type of case or booth or something that comes out of the wall, sticks out of the wall, obviously they're not going to be able to detect that, detect that with the cane that they're using. Um, so making sure that um, there are not low hanging items that are going to hit them or they're going to run into that type of thing, you want to be careful about that. Um, Last, lack of accessible parking. If you go to ada.gov and type in parking, it'll give you the requirements for how many accessible parking spots are required for total number of parking spaces provided. Um, I'm a firm believer that it's always better to have more than less. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, round doorknobs, that's another thing that people don't think of as being a, a, a hindrance, but um, the levers, if you go to the Independence Center, every single door in that office has a lever door handle and no <coughs> round door handles. How many of you guys are, you know, go grocery shopping and you come home and your hands are full and you try and hit the thing? My parents just changed their front door to have a, um, 
It's one that you like push down on the thing. So you can hit it with your elbow and it just opens. It's fantastic. Um, so it doesn't matter how many bags you're holding, you know, it's, it still opens. Um, and then inaccessible restrooms or dressing rooms. Those have to be accessible too. Um, architectural uh, access provisions. So what's readily achievable? So easily accomplished um, and able to be carried out without much difficulty or expense. Um, and the expense comes down to what the particular business can afford. Like I said, there's, it's based on an individual basis. Um, there's no, if you are this type of business, you have to spend this much money, that type of, it doesn't work like that. Um, examples of readily achievable barrier removal. So widening a restroom door, installing grab bars, building a ramp, does anybody know the specifications for a ramp? One six. Nope. One to four. One to four? Twelve to one. So for every, for every one inch up, it has to go 12 feet out. So two to 24, three to 36, that type of thing. Um, and that's on ADA.gov too, just in case anybody's wondering. Um, changing doorknobs to levers, um, reducing the pressure to open a door. How many of you guys have encountered a door that's extremely hard to open? A lot of times that can be adjusted by the little top thingies um, up at the top. It changes the pressure on what's needed to open the door. And there's a little device that you use to figure that out, that type of thing. Um, and purchasing assistive listening devices. So undue burden. Um, it means an overly expensive or taking too much effort or expense and is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, what is readily achievable for one business can be, undue, can be an undue burden for another business based on the size and assets of the business. Um, the example given here is a national chain versus a mom and pop store. Um, that type of thing. Uh, architectural access provisions. So existing facilities, um, readily achievable barriers um, removed. Um, they can use tax credits to improve access and there's quite a few. Um, they do a little research on the computer. They can call the independent center and um, they'll certainly um, assist them in finding something if they fall into that category. Um, new construction built accessible. This would make my job so much easier. I would probably be out of a job if I didn't have, if people didn't make these mistakes. Um, and I really wish that architects or city planners or cities in general would come to the independent center and sit down with us and say, these are our plans for a building. What do you think? What can we do to change them? Are they right? They think that the architects are supposed to know this. Well, a lot of the architects don't pay attention to chapter 11, unfortunately. It's chapter 11, right, of the AAPA? I think it's chapter 11. I'll, I'll check on that and get back to you guys, but I'm pretty sure it's chapter 11. Um, alterations, if, um, if the use changes, then up to 20% of the cost of alterations spent on improving access in primary function area and path of travel. So you have to use, so the amount of money that you're spending on changing features to a building, 20% of it has to be used um, to provide access, so improving access, that type of thing. So um, if a restaurant was redoing their seating area and they had this step in their front thing, and this is just an example, 20% of those funds that they are using to improve their seating area would have to be used um, to fix the access of that step, that type of thing. Um, the new 2010 standards for accessibility. <clears throat> um, ADA standards are the physical requirements for accessibility in the built environment. Um, and they were updated in the fall of 2010, which, geez, that's three years ago. Um, hmm. um, so between, construction between um, September 15th and March 15th, September 15th, 2010, and March 15th, 2012, 
Um, Title II and three entities can choose between the new and old standards on projects um, started during this period. So if a company started building a, a building or whatnot um, during this time frame, they can choose between um, the old standards and the new standards. Why you would want to choose the old standards, I'm not necessarily sure, other than it might be a little cheaper, but not. Um, after March 15th, um, they must use the new 2010 standards. <coughs> Uh, alternative service delivery. So if burial removal is not readily achievable, public accommodations um, must make goods and services available through alternative methods. Um, does everybody understand this? Sometimes this gets a little confusing. So like home visits could be an alternative method. So if a service would normally be received, a person would normally have to come into a building, maybe you could make a home visit, that type of thing. Um, service at other accessible locations, home delivery, doorbell to request service, um, movable chairs to provide access where fixed seating is not accessible, um, and advertise availability of the message relay 711. Communication barriers. Um, they include voice only telephones in hotels, motels, and malls. Uh, hotels are actually getting pretty good about um, having a TTY available, um, which is good. Um, smoke and fire alarms that are solely for visual or, or aural, sorry I can't say that word. Um, a lot of times you'll see a smoke alarm that's just, um, you just hear it or you see a smoke alarm that you just see. Um, having the one that does both is best for hotels, that type of thing. Um, and basically, it'll just flash if it's for someone with a hearing impairment, um, that type of thing. Um, television in hotel rooms um, without closed captioning capability. I don't really see this too much either. Um, people are getting pretty good at this. The main thing with closed captioning um, is when you have a weather emergency, this is where the big complaint comes in with the deaf community. Um, that information that the meteorologist is talking about is supposed to be closed captioned and when you have an event like that, it makes it difficult. Um, and then I've heard the example too is um, they don't put a definition of what the certain things on the weather map. So you know how they'll show like the red and the yellow and all that kind of stuff that it doesn't really, um, some individuals who are deaf um, don't know what that means and they need a key or some type of thing and so that's not explained and they just see the meteorologist circling to this area and you know common sense would say oh red is bad so I should probably not be in that area but still at the same time the weather man is probably saying well this red area is talking about circulation and this is where a tornado could be and so um, if captioning is not there and it's off, then it's just a huge mess. So that's a big issue um, right now. Um, written menus. A lot of times menus have really small, small print. Um, so having a large print menu available would be a great accommodation for a restaurant to have. Um, and then tours offering only spoken descriptions. Um, so another way to do this would be for um, the individual to have a script to read, just give them a copy of the script if they, you know, that type of thing. Um, so available TTYs, um, televisions, closed captioning, I talked about this. <clears throat> Transportation offered by Title III entities. Um, if a business offers transportation services to customers, it must have the means to offer similar services to persons um, who need accessible transportation. So an example would be a hotel with an airport shuttle subcontracts with an accessible van company for s customers using wheelchairs. Um, plain and simple. Title III enforcement. Um, <coughs> Title III is covered by DOJ. Uh, private lawsuits and alternative dispute resolution, including mediation. So the same as <coughs> <coughs> Title 
Title IV, Telecommunications. So each state provides relay services so that individuals with communication barriers can communicate with hearing individuals. Operators um, use relay calls between the TTY user and the telephone user. Um, closed captioning must be provided for federally funded programs. Um, with the Telecommunications Act of 1996, um, it requires emergency broadcasts to be accessible for people with disabilities. I talked about this um, earlier. And closed captioning and emergency information cannot be obscured by crawlers on the screen. Um, they are, uh, so, yeah, that talks about, so you'll see the, um, yeah, it'll say like, um, tornado warning for Southampton County, that type of thing, Ooh, across the bottom of the screen, do you know what I'm talking about now? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, filing complaint um, it's with the FCC, Federal Communication Commission. Oh, I didn't realize we were done that fast. Okay. Um, so this is where you can get some more information. The Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. Um, there are 10 ADA centers um, in the country. So the country is divided up into 10 regions where the Mid-Atlantic region um, and there's their information. Um, the EEOC, uh, Department of Justice, the U.S. Access Board. Um, so the Access Board, do you guys know what the Access Board is? No? Okay. They kind of come up with the regulations. So um, when there is, uh, I'm trying to think of some, uh, so pools and stuff like that. They will say where it needs to be located, like where the lift needs to be located. They come up with the recommendations, proposed regulations, and then what they do is they put those proposed regulations out for public comment a lot of times. And then they'll receive public comment, and they'll come back, and they'll look at public comment, and they'll compare it to their re proposed regulations, and they'll change things, that type of thing, and then they'll submit it again. Yeah. So it's a cycle. And so that's how we get the regulations that we have. And then Department of Justice um, enforces those regulations along with EEOC and FCC. Um, FCC and then of course the Independent Center um, and my email is listed there if you have questions about accessibility feel free to contact me um, and if I don't know the answer I will find out the answer. Um, yeah. So that's it. Um, there's an evaluation, um, if you could complete that, which I think is y'all's. Yes? Um, in that, the question was, um, are these resources good resources for employers who um, might have questions about reasonable accommodations or making their building accessible? Um, I would suggest going local first. Contact the Independent Center. Talk with um, me or um, talk with individuals with disabilities in the community and see you know, what they think, that type of thing. Um, you can certainly get regulations from ADA.gov. That will be helpful. Um, that's a great resource. I use that all the time. Yeah. EEOC. Well, she was saying for um, for finding out if they're accessible, like what they can do to make things better, not if there's a problem. Yeah. Any other questions? And this will help with like individual employees, say employees in accommodation. You will be able to get that. If an individual employee needs accommodation, that one will be able to provide some. Or, or 
sometimes it's, has they made the request in writing? Because that's the other thing that you want to do, um, is make the request in writing and then go from there. You must always tell the employer what you need. The employer does not have to guess what you need. No? Any other questions? No? Okay. Let's thank Emily again for her presentation. We're thankful to go ahead and get some of that meat and potatoes in terms of um, an overview of ADA. For so How many have ever had any type of training or information on ADA before in the past? Okay. How many are new to the, the ADA and what's, okay, great, okay. We're, we're going to, um, now that we have the foundation in terms of the, um, the titles, what's involved um, in terms of compliance, we want to move to the second part of today and talk about what's actually going on with you, and that's the most important part. Um, sometimes even when you have the law, you know what you're supposed to do, it's very hard to comply, and sometimes it's very hard to put those things in action. So what we're gonna do is take a 10-minute break to let you stand up, stretch, um, network, network, network with the people in the room. A lot of times your answers are among you. So take a 10-minute, grab a snack, there are some um, freebies and materials at the back of the table, and we'll be back on in about 10 minutes. We want to go ahead and trans, um, transition into the next section where we kind of hear from you. We kind of hear what's going on in your area, what's going on in your line of the work. And I know we're doing things a little bit um, backwards this morning. We should have probably did this this morning, but we have a large group. But we're going to take a little bit of time to get to know you all. We're going to do something really quick. And I, I said what? Really quick. I want everyone, um, we're going to go table to table, introduce yourself where you're from in terms of what organization, if you're with an organization, and tell us the last book you've read. Oh, Lord. <laughs> so let's go ahead and start. And I'll start with me, how about that? Um, again, my name is Shanita Bethea, and I'm the um, Housing and Human Services Administrator here at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. And the last book I read, and this is probably the third time I've read this book, is Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. That's the last book. So let's start right here at this tape. I want to kind of make sure that everyone here also knows who's in the room, because a lot of times, again, your networking partners, your partners are going to kind of help you in terms of um, coordinating services and doing what you do better. It's kind of sometimes in your room as your colleagues. So let's start right here at this table. Right here. Stand up, if you can. Okay, and she gets a D because she didn't give us her book already. <laughs> Um, 
Charlton is here, our leader, the chair of the Mayor's Commission of People with Disabilities in Norfolk, and the chair of the Hampton Roads uh, Disability Services. We we'll change our name. And the last book I read is the art of the art of collecting about Mr. Uh, the Cohen sisters of Baltimore. Uh, I'm Emily Fisher. I'm not going to introduce myself any further. Um, <laughs> and the last book I read was a book for school on public health. Nothing. <laughs> My name is Barbara Craig, and I'm the former assistant director for Norfolk Department of Human Services. I've been retired. This is my third year. I am a uh, commissioner for Norfolk's um, Mayor's Commission for Persons with Disabilities and a planning member of the board, of uh, regional board actually, because we have several localities involved for persons with disabilities. Um, the last book I read was The Purpose of Human Life. I've also been reading Needless to Say the Bible. And in addition to that, a book by the title of Black Betty, Finding Black Betty. Thank you. You see what I'm doing with my new book list? <laughs> <laughs> I tricked you all. I'm Dorothy Mueller. I'm chair of the uh, Portsmouth ADA Commission. I'm also a school nurse for the Portsmouth Public uh, Schools. And I just finished uh, Special Disabilities of Children in the School Setting. Primarily working with people with traumatic brain injuries. Um, the last book I read was Gone Girl by Julianne Flynn. Oh, yes. Good morning, my name is Joe Tide. 
with me is Rahaka Counselor with Kathy Charities in East Virginia. The reason that I am here today is pretty much to learn more information about disability. I encounter a lot of clients that has disability or already have disability and um, they have some problems with their finances and how to do that. So um, that is very helpful and especially the service um, animals is, is very helpful. Um, the last book I read, I'm still working on, is What to Do When, I don't know who to buy, but it's a, a book I found at one of our Christian office locations because I do have a two-year-old and a three-year-old that drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't get much sleep, so that's what we're reading time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Stacey Carr with Chesapeake Social Services. I'm in the Adult Protective Service Unit. And um, I've been a little busy. I just had a nine-week-old baby. So the last Whoa. book I read was A Girlfriend's Guide to Pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> How much was that true? <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Yes, it tells you all of the stuff that the doctor wants. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Pauline Eamon, I'm the resident manager of the Salvation Army Medicine Center. We're an emergency shelter and day service program and also a soup kitchen um, located on 19th Street in downtown Norfolk. And here it comes, my true self is coming out. I just recently revisited The Hobbit. <laughs> I'm Shay Stacy with the Salvation Army Hope Village Program. It's a transitional housing program for women and their case manager. And this morning I read my 17 month old for about the 100th time a book about Fluttershy, who's a My Little Pony. Oh. Oh. There we go. Wow, that's tough. <laughs> uh, good morning. Uh, Mike Wasberg. I am the uh, director of the City of Norfolk's Office and Homelessness. And the last book I probably totally read was The uh, History of America, which you never learn in school. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Judy Pulling. I'm the Eastern Region um, Emergency Coordinator for the Virginia Department of Health. And the last book I read was Port Mortuary by uh, Patricia Cornwell. <laughs> John Brantley, I'm uh, with the PDC here. I am the Regional Special Needs Planner for the Emergency Management Administration. Uh, we do Ready Hampton Roads. We also do the Ready Hampton Roads Registry for individuals with disabilities and functional access needs. Um, and then we let the reverse management offices know what their needs are and how that we can help them. Um, and I'm actually reading two books right now. Thank you. I have an eight-year-old, and we're currently reading all of the Chronicles of Narnia. And then um, for my so I'm doing the tipping point, which is a book about how to create social epidemics. Sibley. I'm the case manager for Skill Builders. It's an independent living program for 
foster care youth, and they are from the ages of 16 to 23. Oh, 21. <laughs> they can still be in school at that time. But uh, the last book I read was The Perfect Purpose Driven Life Book. This book <laughs> Good morning. My name is Brian Warren. I'm the president and CEO and executive director for Skill Builders Independent Living Program. Um, we're here to, again. We have kids who are some kids who have um, disabilities and want to be able to serve our community a lot better. So that's one of the reasons why we want to be here this morning. Uh, I'm an auditory book person. I listen to a book a week. The last book that I listened to, which I finished yesterday, was Purple Hibiscus. We're going to ignore the one blind person in the room. <laughs> I'm Christopher Heath. I'm a member of the HRDB. I'm also a certified massage therapist for the Department of Defense Navy Exchange Enterprise. And the last book I listened to from the National Library Service for the Print Impaired is the Fifty Shades Trilogy. Oh. <laughs> you tried not to <laughs>
the confident woman by George Fine. <laughs> My name is LaCour Harris. I'm a family services worker with Norfolk Department of Human Services in foster care. Um, and, okay, so I'm ADHD, so uh, I don't remember the name of the book I last read. I can tell you that it was by Max Lucado. That's one of my favorites. He's the only person I can actually read all the way through, uh, which is a, a feat for me. And uh, so, and the reason I can't remember the title is because there are two books now that I'm working on, obviously, would be the Bible. Do that every day. You have to. Um, but also a book called The Harbinger. And I can't tell you the name of the person who, who uh, wrote it because I'm not going to remember. But it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Hi, I'm Chiquita Crandall. I work with the Norfolk Department of Human Services, Foster Care Reunification. Am I loud enough? I'm too loud. Okay, yes. yes. With the Foster Care Reunification Unit, I'm a family service worker. Um, the last book I read was The Power of Vision by Miles Monroe, and I'm currently reading a book by Linda Turkis, What Happens When a Woman Say Yes to God. I have a little back issue today. Uh, hi, my name is John Boyle, and I'm a homeless coordinator with the city of Virginia Beach. And uh, the last uh, book I read, and, and it's really a short story, it's called The 13th Floor, and it's by my 12-year-old son, Ryan. Aww. I'm Pam Wakefield, and I'm one of the Senior Disaster Program Managers for the Red Cross of the Eastern Virginia region. And uh, well, we focus a little bit more on the future of ADA compliant disaster sheltering, and as well as our everyday uh, disaster programs. Uh, the last book that I actually finished was Take This Bread by Sarah Miles and how she ended up with a, a hoity-toity type church as she described it and started a food bank that reached out to everybody and all the undesirables in the community in California. It is a true story. Good morning. I'm Kelly Peterson. I'm the Human Resources Administrator here at the Planning District Commission. The last book I read, actually I'm in the middle of one, I'm finishing up my master's degree in public administration, so I wouldn't put this on my reading list if I were you, but it's public policy analysis and evaluation. So. <laughs> and I'm Stephanie Potter with DARS, that's the Department for the Aging and Rehabilitative Services. I'm also a member of the Hampton Roads Disability Board. The last book I read was my, with my five-year-old called Hop. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Barry Schreiber, City of Virginia Beach. I'm the ADA coordinator for the city, and, uh, in addition to being the facilities manager for the city. Um, I am uh, a member of the Hampton Roads Disabilities Board, and Trinita probably doesn't realize it's football season, I don't have time to read <laughs>
person who's standing up, what they're actually doing. And then also, because normally when you do introductions, you go, okay. But it really kind of grabs you when you're interested in finding out what other people are reading and, and the diversity into it. Another thing that I noticed when we stood up and we gave what we do, a lot of people listed multiple hats that they wear. So a lot of times, ADA issues is um, something that you may be dealing with, but it's a, it's a whole plethora of other in information and, and job duties that you have to do. So um, it's very good to have such a diverse group here today. As you can see, we have um, from case managers to, to teaching to human resources. So that's pretty much this type of arena and this type of diversification is what's really going to help us learn um, about more about um, persons with disabilities and how to access care for them. So um, I'm very excited to have all of you all here from a very diverse, because I can see people writing notes of, oh, I need to talk to this person, I need to, I didn't know that this existed. So that's kind of um, why we wanted to have this section, because we wanted to make sure that you knew all the other access to services that are out here, because sometimes you feel when you're in your office that you're in a vacuum. A lot of times it's very easy talk about what's not working. We always concentrate on what's not working, how the system could be better. But I want to talk a little bit, someone can share with me what's working. What do you foresee in the region, in this area, in your neck of the woods, in your area of expertise? Something that's actually working when it comes to um, looking at services and providing quality care for the people that we, we serve. Does anyone have any success stories? Many of you might not be aware that the Social Security Office moved to off a military highway way back without any access and reference to transportation, so people had to walk. In addition to that, there was no curb there for people to uh, walk on. They had to walk in the middle of the street. So, you know, one of the things that we think about often is that this is too big. There's really, I, I, it's terrible, but I don't think there's anything that we can do about it. Well, we, the uh, Mayor's Commission, along with members of this body in terms of the planning aspect of it, and other uh, uh, partners with the aging, aging uh, partners, aging. senior Commission. services recommendation had a part in it. What we managed to do was to present to transportation, the Board of Transportation, the Hampton mm -hmm. Roads, and City Council, she's going to feed me. <laughs> and what we managed to do, and we're very proud of this, to make a presentation to them in reference to what was going on. Needless to say, we always think in terms of, oh, they know what's happening, they don't care, and da 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 da. But a lot of times, they're not really fully aware. As you know, Social Security crosses all boards in reference to the constituents coming from. Chesapeake from Portsmouth and different areas um, of the state of Virginia. Many of them came as far as Franklin. So the idea that people couldn't get there, especially those people who had small children, needless to say it's not just people who are disabled, but people who have children that they're applying for social security cards, the danger involved in them getting <coughs> to that office. And many of them, because transportation stopped at military highway mm -hmm. and you had to walk and also cross a very dangerous uh, street to get there, could not get there to appeal for when they were denied benefits. So one of the things that, many things that we were instrumental in doing is to bring that to the attention of city council in Norfolk, and they are now, to, Shirley, you can tell them what they've done. Okay, the, the bottom line is, is that we invited other agencies to work with us, the Mayor's Commission including the, uh, the aging and long-term care, care and time for us. I do the presentation, and the result is we have them change the bus stops to make it closer to the building. We have the, uh, the sidewalks to the bus stop, and that's, of course, completely accessible and has a cover over it. Um, uh, and then sidewalks to the building. 
now we're taught now they are talking to the owners of the building to create a another access into the building that's closer they don't have to go through the parking lot um, it was a great great achievement because it took five years for them to to even think about it and it took us three months to get it done Excellent. Excellent. Anyone else? Oh, wait, I just want to say, the city of Norfolk has become much aware, very aware of our, our commissioner because we, we voice our opinions and we, we make statements. They have now made, the city of Norfolk has now made accessibility priority number one in their, in their planning. They are forming a a group of resident representatives of all of the leaders of every of every um, organization <coughs> to meet with us, the mayor's commission, and have an open forum about all their planning for the future and what's happening today. You have to you have to speak to the right people and be forceful, but be nice. And we are we have experience of excellent results.
are trainings that are more specific to some of either the titles that Emily went over or specific needs if you see it in terms of um, housing or transportation issues so that we could uh, pretty much give a, a better regional perspective of what's out there. So um, please be, be sure that when you turn in your evaluation, if it's something that comes to mind that you think uh, we should have another training on, another seminar, please jot that down because we're going to try to take that information and um, create a, a list of other lunch and learns or series of trainings that would be beneficial to the masses. But these are some barriers that we looked at in terms of um, access to care, access to providing services, employing persons with disabilities. When you have a, a counselor, uh, when you're a counselor and you have a client that's coming in that needs assistive te adaptive technology, how do you maneuver the system? How do you find out what is actually uh, required of you. And a lot of times when you read ADA, or even Sylvia would tell you in terms of fair housing, you're reading it, you understand it, but applying it and um, adhering to it is something totally different. When you're in your office and you have a client across, the, uh, either on the phone or across the uh, desk from you, what happens now? So I'm just a misinformation or lack of education. A lot of times we don't know seminars like this. We don't know where to get the information. Even though the you know, internet um, is, has a lot of great information, but how many have looked at two different sites and seen two totally different definitions? Yeah. Or talked to two different coordinators and said, am I required to do this? And one says yes, and then the other one says no. So sometimes misinformation is, very, is a huge barrier. Lack of coordination. We have a lot of agencies out here. Some doing the same thing, some doing exactly opposite. So a lot of times what you see is a coordination of services and people partnering, it's much better for a client. A lot of times we see a client coming to your office, they have to fill out a complete paperwork, and then they go to the next office and have to fill out a complete, and a lot of clients give up. It's just so, it's so massive in terms of, of doing that. Um, so coordinating services um, is sometimes a barrier. Of course, we all know if, if you stood up and you gave five different hats that you wear, funding and capacity is a huge issue. Um, be it if you are HR rep or if you're uh, working in case management or working directly with clients, having the funding to go to training, having the funding to provide care for your clients, and having capacity in terms of enough staff to do it. We all are, are doing three to four different jobs. Myths and stereotypes, what people perceive with the disabled, what they hear, how they feel. So it's kind of tied in, term, in terms of bias and prejudice, but those are some things that create those barriers that are really hard sometimes to work through. Are there others that you have seen in your line of work? Delilah? Okay, ours has to do with systems where the kids are disabled and the child welfare or child system, when it goes to the adult system, so this, it's not connected for us, so there's a disjunct, so, you know, the child system is a whole bunch of services, it's always a bunch of people they're transitioning out of care. Mm -hmm. There's not a smooth flow. You don't really know who to contact. Okay. And it's really, for us, it's very frustrating. Because so that's a more of an issue of systemic, because it's systems, and just pretty much like Emily said, fair housing, you know, considers service animals this, but ADA considers this. So a lot of times you see our federal agencies that have totally different regs, and also they, you see those wide gaps even when you come to those services. So I think that's more of a system um, or a process. Yeah, I think it's more a process because it's just like it's, it's really two different systems. So you're leaving a child system going to an adult system where it's totally different. Um, it's just like you don't know where to connect with, and you know, you're really a kid with young adults, 18, 21, me, and they're just they're coming back to us, and we really don't know. I know for us, it was some kind of way that the systems would talk to each other. Talk to each other. Yeah. And she's here, and she's in Chesapeake, and she's kind of saying the same thing, insurance and trying to get them insured. And what Medicaid does, your children have Medicaid, Medicaid for adults is you know, way different. They don't cover a lot of burdens that children receive. So we can put adults in also there? That's a huge issue. Did I see another hand? Okay. You want to expand on that? Or are you saying? Oh, we just had several of them, ADA and other okay. housing. 
a lot of times there's a need for more advocacy and policy change in terms of, um, like they mentioned, in terms of making city council aware of what's going on or making it public officials. So that was something that we also um, had a suggestion about round tables with elected officials and making sure they're around the table and really understanding what you all are facing the field with how you all have to um, conduct your communications with the government. Communication, not communicating with each other. Okay. We saw that with um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Federal Highway HUD and EPA came out with a sustainability grant that they were supposed to be really working together with. But when you read the regulations for all three, they were totally different, even though it was the same grant. So we see sometimes that those agencies are not talking at that federal level. Sure. I just wanted to just say also, um, because I don't work for anyone, I am a free agent, but I know the ADA and I know FHA and I know how to apply it. I'm also a mediator. Um, and very often people are affected by two, two laws. They, and they, have, they hire an attorney and the, the attorney only knows one law. Uh, there was a, a, a case for senior citizen housing, and it was a very public case, and the resident had an attorney that only talked about ADA, when actually it was an FHA issue. And there again, 10 months out of the litigation, $25,000, I was able to come in, clarify the issues, and in two weeks it was resolved. Mm -hmm. So you have to be aware of the different regulations out there, and how to marry it, and how it gets involved, and totally confused. So you have to separate it. Mm -hmm. So it's your, your job to un understand that. Anyone else? Or anyone from, um, in terms of um, some of our human resource people, in, 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 in various, in terms of hiring that you have seen?
or the patients there in the wheelchairs. They had these wheelchairs and they were children or before they finished school and now they outgrown them, the legs are too long, they're breaking down like him. He cannot sit up any further than this. That's because they hooked it up. Medicare would not pay for the wheelchair. He go out all the time, you know, to church, at least three or four times a week, he go out into the community with church members or friends or with uh, Agatha. And he can't get a new wheelchair. So, and that's not just him. It's several, almost all of my associates that are in the Norfolk nursing home, they need wheelchairs and they can't get them. So it's equipment, so they need right. up-to-date equipment. Um, equipment. Yes. equipment. And that's also a funding issue. And it's a regulatory issue that they're not allowing so many wheelchairs to every time. Yeah. 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 Well, they say every time. Extra raised money and brought him this wheelchair made like uh, yeah. 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And they can't get a wheelchair in five years if they're living in a nursing home. Yes. They cannot get one. Yeah. So that's a huge barrier. Anything else? Thank you for sharing. Let's move really quickly. We talked about, and she kind of was a great segue into um, those, those type of issues that come up. How can the region improve? Um, we're looking at housing issues, we're looking at transportation issues, access to care. Um, what can we do to improve um, to improve coordination of services? I was just going to add public accommodations. We're talking about housing and we're talking about uh, services. But I'm talking about I'm thinking of public accommodations in the museums, in the theaters, in the restaurants. You have to be you have to be knowledgeable of, it's your responsibility to be knowledgeable about the law and to help them make it more accessible. Because without, without the, the finer things in life, you only have a half a life. The whole idea is total immersion in, in society. That's great. Okay. She said it was a touchy subject yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of how can the uh, region that's an open, yes, a big open question. Um, but um, you want to take a step back? She wants to take a step back. Well, yes, I said it was such a subject because um, I think part of it is it's very political. And um, a lot of entities or even cities see themselves as working in silos. And if we're going to really be creative and productive, it has to be, we have to take it on a regional. And that's something that um, Mayor Frame or Mayor Sessions or Mayor whomever, are you taking this part? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have be necessarily interested in talking about. And that's whether it's housing or if we um, coordinate all of the services that we have or pool our funding in order to do something. It, it's a touchy subject in that respect, but it's something that is desperately needed. And transportation as well. So there are conversations that definitely need to be had. This is Peggy from Florida. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was Peggy from Florida. Say thanks, Peggy. I, I would just like to respond to, to that because there have been regional discussions, uh, particularly around homelessness. <coughs> uh, we have uh, developed single room occupancy housing across the region. And that only became a reality because all of the jurisdictions within this region got together, sat at the table, and said, we're going to make this work. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it can be done. Yes. Uh, and, I, I, and I think what jo something that clicked to mind in terms of just this board itself, because the disability service boards were um, in the past mandated by the Virginia Assembly to be funded. Well, back in what, 2008, they changed it that um, it was no longer funded, but that uh, jurisdictions could still have a disability service board. So that became a huge thing for us, is that you're saying you do great work, it's needed, but unfortunately we're not able to fund it. So I just applaud the disability service board because a lot of them just fell out um, when the funding fell out, that this board was able to kind of keep, keep together and continue to try to do things like this. But I think the audience is to is kind of need to get that consensus back um, with everybody around the table, just as we did with um, Heron Planning and closing and all the other SROs, because that was a joint with venture from a lot of jurisdictions.
jurisdictions and a lot of coordination. Again, that word, um, coordination. So we, we know two words today, coordination and partnership in Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs>
access to other providers, um, which we hope that you've been able to at least meet one person that you didn't know or didn't realize um, was out there. Of course, um, more funding. born and raised in human services all of my life has been spent professionally in human services. And one of the things that I've learned is getting the right people at the table and developing a system of care. What's going to happen when this happens and you'll already have the plan in place so that everybody knows, including those people in the fiscal department, what kind of funding is available for this particular plan. So you don't develop plans without having that kind of supportive uh, system in place that, will, that you can follow through on. So having people within your agency as well as outside of your agency, everybody's experiencing the same kind of problem. So together, you can develop that system of care within regulations. I mean, you use policy as a guideline, but you, you don't have to go outside of that guideline in order to develop what it is that you need. So awareness is first, and then bringing the right people to the table to develop that plan in reference to what happens next to the people that you're trying to serve. Excellent. And I've learned from this body, from the uh, disability board, that you don't have to have money to do that. You know, we always think, well, we don't have any money, so we can't do anything. We don't have to have money to sit down at a table and come together in reference to the best way to service the, uh, the people that you're trying to serve. Excellent. That's an excellent point. A lot of times we do things in the silo. Yes. And yeah. we get stuck with doing what we did in 1978, 1984. Um, but a lot of times when you sit down, and it really makes it so much easier for a client because we are regional. Um, you may live in Portsmouth, you may work in Norfolk, your children are in Chesapeake. We, we jump to the stations, we jump to services, we jump how we shop. So sitting, up, sitting down and, and having that, um, that, that conversation that you're coming up, and we did that with the homeless. A lot of the homeless issues, a lot of uh, um, intake, a lot of things are being coordinated that there's one intake form, there's one way to access services, has made it easier for people who are already doing multiple jobs. So that's an excellent point. Anything else that we left off of the two business?
something if, you, if your name wasn't on our registration so we can make sure that we have a, um, included <coughs> list. And what we will normally do is I can send out a test email to, to everyone to make sure that the information you gave us when you registered was correct. And it will have um, name, your organization, and your email address. And if you want to give a description or any other information about your agency, I can take that information and we can put it in a directory of participants. That way we have these things. That would be helpful. That would be helpful. Thank you for adding. Anything else? Next steps? Would you like to see this quarterly, yearly, every six months? Other information as you see that comes through that may be beneficial as it relates to trainings or changes in the laws? No, what, what will be beneficial to you all? Anything else? Let's just let me add that there is a place on your evaluation that you can put other topics of interest that you want us to do and, and what would be good uh, for you in reference to the educational awareness aspect, how to. So we're open to a whole lot of things. We just need to hear from you in reference to what your needs are. And we thank you all for coming and sharing. Um, my book list for the next two years is full. <laughs> um, I'm glad that you um, um, hopefully found this information and networking um, valuable. And we're going to turn it back over to our chair, Shirley. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the wonderful session we had. This is our first of many sessions, and please Give us your evaluation so we learn from you, too. We hope that you learned a little bit about more about the ADA and refresh what you already knew. Our goal is to reach our city employees and citizens through education so we can better serve you and everyone with, and all our persons with disabilities so they can have a full inclusion in the city life. We'd like to thank the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission for hosting this forum and for their support each month at our meetings. We thank all of the cities for their assistance. We have all of our cities being involved in what we do. Thank you for coming and we'll see you again.